Hello, it's another Richard Holmes Letter Squared Theatre podcast. My guest for the second time is Susan Kalman. Lots of fun for this one. Um, here's some stuff coming up. If you live in London, there's a few chances to see me live. You can come and see both or one of the recordings of As It Occurs To Me that are still to come. There's one on the 15th of January and one on the 12th of February, both at the Leicester Square Theatre. Um, we've pretty much run out of money uh, and we have a bit more filming to do, so your door money will go to filming new sketches for As It Occurs To Me. It'd be lovely to have full, a full theatre for those last two. It's going pretty well. Uh, I'm also at the Leicester Square Theatre on the 16th, 17th and 18th of February doing my new two show, tour show, The Best, which is 90 minutes of what I consider to be my best extractable stand-up routines from the 12 shows that I've done on my own. Um, that is also on tour, so if you want to come and see that in the UK and Ireland, uh, go to www.richardherring.com slash the underscore best slash tour and you can see all of the dates there or richardherring.com slash gigs or just go to richardherring.com and just click around till you find something that looks like the dates. Um, anyway, let's enjoy uh, Rahala Stepper Rahala Stepper with Susan Kalman. It is nice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre for the first post-president-elect Trump podcast. We please welcome a man who is quite upset about that. It's Richard Herring! Thank you very much. Welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre. And my name is Rich Herring. This is Rich Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast. But I saw some kids uh, down in the local library... Uh, playing with the Rubik snake. Uh, the, the Rubik snake. That's, that's good. Uh, they called it Rahula Stepper. So I don't know if that's, that's going to catch on. Uh, so yeah, I'm very upset uh, about. Uh, uh, we've been talking about it. Well, this podcast doesn't go out till January, which is about the time when the uh, president will actually become the president. Uh, but this this was recorded. The first uh, recording post uh, the American election results. Uh, so uh, we will, it seems, unbelievably have uh, President Trump. Though I'm going to make a confident prediction. I think by the time January comes along, Donald Trump will be dead. That is my, <laughs> that is my confident prediction. Uh, so uh, you heard it here first, but you probably have heard it on the news if it has happened. Uh, but A, you know, someone's going to take a pop at him, obviously. Probably the Republican Party. And B... <laughs> Uh, but he's just like, he didn't realise what he was getting into at all. I don't think he knew what it was. I think he just thought it was a competition you won and got a, like a badge or something. And then, yeah, I have a hat that says I am the president. And then that would be the end of it. But it's very stressful. And he's an old man. He's not very well, I don't think. I don't think, I don't think he's going to make it. Uh, so that's, that's the only way. I would say that's the only kind of consolation. But all the people who are under him are all pricks as well. So it's, it's not the only way if they, or if they could all die. If all of the in some kind of ISIS bombing. That would be the... <laughs> if that's happened, you all owe me 20 quid. That's, everyone has owed me 20 quid. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, hello to Brian uh, O'Callaghan, I think his surname is, who's uh, in the audience. Where are you? There's Brian. You're the, uh, you're the VIP guest tonight. Thank you for coming along. We may come to you for a question for Susan. You've got a special hat which you uh, have in your pocket. That's for a... There we go. And uh, drinking fine. You're, you're drinking champagne. Now, usually when I buy the champagne, I just go to Sainsbury's and buy the cheapest champagne they have, which costs £15 a bottle. But they've run out of the £15 bottle. I had to pay £21 for that. <laughs> so you've literally got a £6 more of champagne. Usually you have to share that with the other. Don't, you're the only one. You get a whole bottle of champagne, £21. That almost makes the money you've paid worthwhile. So that is that, a very... <laughs> Very annoyed about that, but we, if I forget to come to you, I apologise, do shout out. I don't, don't think there was any um, sponsors, uh, any uh, product placement this time. I hope not, because uh, I haven't written it down. So uh, anyway, let's, <laughs> let's crack on. Uh, our guest tonight uh, is probably best known for her appearance and, and think, narration of the show Disaster Chefs. Uh, <laughs> though you'll also recognise her from Don't Drop the Baton. That is what she's best known for. <laughs> It's Susan Calvin, ladies and gentlemen. Here she is. Susan Calvin. Come in. Please sit down. Welcome. 
We've got some coke for you. Nothing's been dipped in it. It's fine. <laughs> um, how are you doing? I'm fine, It's thank nice you to very have much. you back. You know, we, you were first on uh, this Leicester Square Fit podcast. You've been on the Edinburgh one a couple of times. Yeah. Um, two and a half years ago. Yeah. It was the week uh, that the that Malaysian airplane disappeared. Do you remember that? That one that disappeared? <laughs> It and I said epic. in the podcast, by the time this goes out, everyone will know what happened to that plane. Oh, and but they, no, no one knows what happened. No one knows. No. Still told. So I, I, I blame you for that. So uh, <laughs> uh, what was Disaster Chefs all about? I don't think we talked about that last time. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> if, you, if you haven't heard the previous podcast I've done with Richard Taylor, <laughs> he treats me with just, there's no respect <laughs> at all. You, 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 I'm impressed you've done any research at all for this interview, because usually you just sit there and talk about yourself. <laughs> and I have to join in occasionally. <laughs> Disaster Shift was a programme for Children's BBC where children learned to cook and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> were they bad at it, though? That seems... A well, it was their parents negative. who were bad at cooking. It was okay. a very good show. <laughs> What about Don't Drop the Baton? What about that show? <laughs> what, was that what was that one? That was a special comedy show for the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow uh, okay. that I hosted and uh, did some sketches in. Oh, I'm really disappointed. I genuinely thought you'd been, like, become a conductor in an orchestra or something. <laughs> no, I it was a special kind of show, which was of a very high quality, okay. um, about the Commonwealth Games yeah. to celebrate how wonderful Glasgow and Scotland was during the Commonwealth Games. Is that available on DVD to purchase that? No, there wasn't enough demand for it to... Uh, <laughs> but at the time, several hundred people very much enjoyed it. No, I have done my research. I've, have I've researched you? you very carefully. The only thing I couldn't really find out in the research is, do you have a boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> no, <that's laughs> the only I don't know if that's happening. <laughs> so, um, I had a boyfriend once. Did you? Yeah, well, I think you had, you had sex with a man on one occasion. I did. How did that work out for you? <laughs> well, I thought I should check. Yeah. Uh, that you, I wasn't might, you can't just sleep with one man. That might, you might just have been a very bad... I mean, it's quite insulting to the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. had one uh, time. Nope, never uh, again. Annoyingly, uh, this, so I, I knew I was a laser. And I thought I should check in case I was just doing it for attention, because you're never quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, I better, I better do this. And I did. And, oh. And <laughs> the other day, I, I haven't seen him, obviously, since. Uh, it came up, you know, on Facebook, it's like people you might know. And his face popped up, and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> Hope he hasn't read my book. Um, <laughs> but I talk about the experience. Uh -huh. Yeah. But thanks for bringing that. I'm happily married, yes. Richard, to a woman. Yeah. For How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> we just hold hands and watch news night. Okay. That's all we do. Uh, yes, uh, 14 years I've been with... Uh, wow. You know my wife. You've I met do, my wife. I do. She's lovely, yeah. Yeah, she is lovely. Yeah, you've done Terrifying. Well. She, she is quite scary. Yeah, she is. But I like, in I a good way. In a good way. No, she doesn't like yeah. have a knife or anything. <laughs> but she is terrifying. Yeah. I think you've still done well, though, out of that, out of that partnership. <laughs> Yes, I have, haven't I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a very big compliment to her. It is. Because you well, are amazing. Well, she's not people. here, but I'll fucking phone her later <laughs> and tell her. <laughs> Richard says you're quite hot. Yeah, nice, nice. And she's, you know, she's, uh, I like her. Like it's often with, <laughs> often with like comedians' partners, you meet them in dressing rooms and they, they all kind of mould into one a little bit. But Lee, I know, Lee, you know, I don't remember her name and everything. <laughs> it's kind of, I don't just to go, oh, hello, y y you. you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to be quite awkward. Um, yeah, she's very nice. She's yeah, very she's nice. Done well. she, she puts up with um, my glamorous showbiz lifestyle. Well, it's difficult. It is difficult for you. I mean, I think all for all comedians it's difficult, but mm. you're t you seem to be, well, because you live in Glasgow, but you do yeah. a lot of work in London mm -hmm. and you tour a, a lot, as we all do. Mm -hmm. So you're away from home a lot. Yep. Uh, and. Uh, that must be, it's difficult both ways, right? It's difficult. It's quite difficult because uh, I sometimes worry I'm going to go home and she'll have changed the locks <laughs> or found someone else. Yeah. 
because I'm down in, I'm doing the Soho Theatre just now, so I've rented a, a flat in Soho, uh, and then I'm away for another week, then I'm away for another week. So it's quite, it's quite difficult, because yeah. she gets used to living on her own, and I get used to living on my own, and then we have to go and actually have some form of relationship with each other. <laughs> and that's difficult, yeah. because she just likes playing the PlayStation and eating omelettes, and I hate both of those things. <laughs> Maybe she, well, Tom Baker used to have a different... Ha I think he lived in a different house to his wife. I think it was Tom Baker. Really? <laughs> yeah, but they had houses that were near each other, but they right. didn't live in the same... So maybe, that'd be a, maybe that's the success of a I marriage. I don't think that's really a marriage, then, no, I is yeah, it? I mean, just you get together when you want to get together and you have your separate times. And there's a, but there's then, is that not the case that you would eventually just not want to get together with someone because it's just nicer being on your own? <laughs> <laughs> you know, th there is a... I, I, I hate being away from her. I really hate being away from her, but at the same time... For the week in Soho, I, I can do what I like. Yeah. Which isn't a lot. <laughs> you know, on Friday night, I was in bed by nine o'clock, yeah. just listening to the sounds of Soho outside. Because <laughs> Soho's frightening. It's terrifying. Yeah. yeah, it sounds sort of glamorous to be living in Soho, oh, but it's, it's not it's nice. It never sleeps, Soho. I walked past a shop the other day in Soho, and there were things in the window, and I don't know what they were. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were for boys. That's the only thing I could think. <laughs> I'm living above a Mr. Lasagna. <laughs> that's a real thing, Mr. Lasagna. Okay. Yeah. After Brexit, that'll go though. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> probably a good thing. Do you get? But do you get lonely on tour? I mean, I find tour, I found touring. I, I weirdly, once I got into the, my relationship with my wife, I found touring a bit easier. If anything, the loneliness of it. I miss my family. Mm -hmm. But like, the, bef the before that, I would get quite. You know, it's a very. Do you, do you, ha do you have a tour manager to tour with other people? No. Nope. You're, you're on your own. On my own, my rucksack, my suitcase, yeah. and off a pop to the Premier Inns. Of this great country. Yeah, I mean it's real. I mean I just remember. It's suicidal. Yeah, it's essentially. terrific. It's <laughs> when you go back after a gig and the only people in the bar are a couple of uh, travelling salesmen and a lorry driver, and you think, Jesus, this is it. That's why I don't drink on tour because if I would really drink, yeah, like I'd I'd hammer that every night, just pissed as a fart in a premier end. and sometimes because. All Premier Inns really look the same. Sometimes when I'm on tour, I wake up like really panicked because I don't know where I am. Yeah, no, because they they all look the same, and I'm just in and I don't know where I am, and it's quite frightening. It is. I, that happened to me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I I used to tour like 14 days in a row, and yeah, stay in the cheapest hotels I could yeah. get, and they were all they were absolutely all the same, and you just yeah. sometimes absolutely panic about not yeah. even remembering where you were last yeah. night, where you're going. And sometimes it's, it's really depressing. I was in a Premier Inn somewhere. I don't know where. And I was having my cooked breakfast in the morning, which actually makes me feel physically sick. Now, when you start, you go, oh, I cook breakfast every day, this will be lovely, and then eventually you, make you feel physically sick. Yeah. But I was having a, my cooked breakfast, and something like Sinead O'Connor, nothing compares to you, was on this day, like something really <laughs> cheerful. And it was pissing down. And I had another four days to go, and a child walked up and said, hello. And I said, oh, hello. And uh, she said, didn't you used to be on the television? <laughs> How old was the child as well? That's <laughs> seven. <laughs> and then she just went, bye. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I find it very depressing, I have to yeah. say. I do, I find it very depressing. Uh, so not, not the spreading joy to hundreds of people. But well, the difficulty the is you're right? going from, you know, you're going hopefully from a room full of laughing people to then, and then that is the juxtaposition. <laughs> but if you've had a good gig, it's, the, you've weird, had a good gig, it's yes. the weird juxtaposition of that amazing thing, then suddenly everyone like, disappears into the night yeah. and then suddenly you are sitting in a travel lodge yeah. bar and my worst one was I remember Cambridge Junction which I have talked about this before but I was in Cambridge Junction I was staying in the travel lodge opposite Cambridge Junction which you may know and there was a bogey a massive bogey on my shower curtain <laughs> that I'd got to the shower and I'd looked in and I thought I can't, I, you know, I'd just got in the room and I thought I can't be bothered to change the rooms and so I just had to when I had the shower I just had to push the shower curtain as far away from me as possible and I sat in the bar as you described drinking a red wine not wanting to go back to my room because it had someone else's bogey in it. <laughs> but it was sort of, it had been such a brilliant show. And then, that, and then yeah, yeah. sitting in the bar of a travel lodge with a bogey on the Sometimes shower curtain. Though, was I, the I used to say on tour where I was staying, just as a joke, just to, sh you know, because some people think I lead a very glamorous life, obviously. And I would say, no, I'm staying in, you know, whatever hotel it was. And I had to stop doing that because people, I stayed in a hotel once and uh, some of the audience followed, followed me to the hotel and then phoned up to the room. Oh, yes, yeah. Okay. And... That was awkward, yeah. because I didn't know if I'd been given out signals that said, oh, please follow me to my hotel, <laughs> and then phone me, and then we'll just have sex, because yeah. I, don't, I don't remember saying that. I mean, it's some of your audience, that's pretty, I, mean, I think I might have taken that up if it's like a, several people. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> not just one person. Richard. If it's one person, it could be a nut. If it's several, you know, that's, a, that's an evening's entertainment. No! Isn't it? <laughs> that's not what I do on tour. No, no, me. No. <laughs> it's my wife is this. God, I wish. I wish, <laughs> I wish I had the energy to even. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, I, stayed, I was in Manchester the other day and like, in the Frog and Bucket and I stayed, I've stayed in the same hotel there for a, quite a few years and stayed over. And then when I first went to the Frog and Bucket and I was a single man, it was always a lot of fun. You'd go drinking with the, with the staff there and, you know, and stay out till three o'clock in the morning and I had quite a lot of fun in that town. And then this time I was just going back and I was just delighted to be back in the, in the hotel room and back to go to sleep and hoping I could sleep beyond five o'clock in the morning. That's, it. That's how much my life has changed. Because I don't have the, I wouldn't have the energy for it. No. If anyone was interested, mm, which right. they really aren't anymore. Right. So. <laughs> what you, apart from you, Susan, I know that's. What oh, that, yes. I know that's what that look meant. I in can read head, a woman's. In your books. head, genuinely, do you think I'm sexually interested? In it? I'm really interested because we think, we play flirt, we yeah. play flirt with each other. Is there a part of you that thinks that this is real? <laughs> <laughs> It's not a part of it, doesn't it? <laughs> God, that would be. Wouldn't that be? That'd be like if we did one of those uh, television shows where you go away for ages. And we got pissed one night and we we're like, oh, let's just try it. Wouldn't that be the worst night? <laughs> you know, cause I think you'd find it be the best. Night. <laughs> you'd suddenly go, oh, that guy. It was the guy. It, it was, was just the guy. The guy. I've just been. I just did it with the wrong guy. <laughs> no. <laughs> Why don't you have a tour manager or something, or a support act or something, then you wouldn't be so lonely on Can't afford it. You can afford it. You're on Radio 4 all the time. <laughs> Look at those Radio 4 checks yeah. coming in. Uh, can't afford it. No. Can't afford it at all. Nope. Because because I don't live in London, and I have to stay over most of the time, a lot of people drive to and from gigs, I can't. I just can't afford it. Yeah. Can't afford it at all. And also, I don't know who would support me, because my audience are very beautiful, strange creatures who become offended by the strangest things. <laughs> and I would need to have someone else who was similarly Radio 4-minded and liberal and liked cats in order to set up the whole thing. <laughs> and I would be worried. I had a support act once that I didn't want. Someone put one on eh, before I came on. And the, the audience were f actually physically repulsed by this man <laughs> because he was talking about sex and things. Like that. And my audience don't enjoy that kind of thing. They don't like to think about it. Yeah. One thing I never talk about really is sex because I actually feel physically sick saying the word just now. <laughs> I, I pretend to be all flirty. I'm actually a hugely repressed woman when it comes to that kind of thing. Really repressed, like really repressed. I can't, I can't watch, everyone says, oh, have you seen Orange is the New Black? No, that's too much, it's, all, it's wrong. I do not like it. <laughs> They're just, it's, it's all, the, all the time. And you think, have a break. Yeah. You can't have sex that much. Have, you're in prison, have a break. Have a break. <laughs> Don't have enjoy a break being in from prison. from all the shower then, sex. Yeah. yeah. I just, it makes me very uncomfortable, Richard. Yeah. You know, when you talk about things like that. Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop talking about it then. Um, you, uh, <laughs> we'll see what, when we get to the emergency questions, how you like those and how, <laughs> how your fans feel about those. Uh, so, um, you, you like cats. Yep. You Skype your cats when you're on tour. Yeah. How do they respond to that? Do they understand what's going on? I did it last night. Did you? Yep. Do, they, do the cats know it's you? They, well, last night, uh, Dr. Abigail Bartlett responded to my... <laughs> <laughs> I found out something beautiful. My friend pointed out to me that... Uh, so, uh, I've got Pickle, Olivia Pope, <laughs> strong female uh, role models, uh, Dr. Abigail Bartlett, Daisy V. Harper, and DCI Jane Tennyson. <laughs> And if you Google DCI Jane Tennyson, my cat now appears in the image search, <laughs> which is just the nicest thing that's ever happened. I miss him. So I, 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 I FaceTime the wife, and then she takes it around the flat, and I say, Mummy loves you, Mummy loves you. And they go, wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. That's nice. My, my cat died last month. I know, I heard you one talking of, about it last my night. Cats died, yeah. yeah. You made some jokes about how you didn't care. I know, I do. I know. That was the cover. That was the cover up. It, well, I'm annoyed because my wife, you know, I, I, ten years ago, I was living. A, I was a single man. I had no one <laughs> responsible for me. I didn't have to care about anyone. Yeah. Then my wife comes along, makes me love her first of all, and then she gets. I didn't. She's she got. A bitch, she got she? cats, and I didn't want cats. So she said, "Oh no, great, get cats." We had cats, and then I f love them now, and then got a baby, and I have to love that as well. <laughs> 
and then you know, and then one of the cats died. So it, well, I'd be much better off, wasn't I, with, for, before all this no. happened? No, you weren't. I was. Richard. I could just be no, on my own, Richard. and I you wouldn't really be. Weren't. I wouldn't be sad. Since, would I? You, since your wife m- made you love her, <laughs> yeah. you are a much better person, Richard. You were a lovely person before, but now you're like you're like an almost a normal person. <laughs> you know, and uh, part of being a human being is loving things, and that disappointment when the love. Dies. You lose them. It's terrible. You do. I've 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 lost three cats. I've I have their ashes on my mantelpiece. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I paid some like six hundred pounds to have them cremated. Yeah. Uh, seriously. <laughs> and I have their ashes on the £600 mantelpiece. Six hundred pounds is a lot, though. Well, you get them cremated, then you get a special urn. Okay. We we paid a lot of money for the urns. And well, it's good because our cat got cremated. We paid sixty pounds to get our cat cremated, and uh, they, they <laughs> seriously, it got it, the ashes are in a box in a like in a paper bag with like string handles, and we put it on the dining room table. And every time I look at, it, I think, oh, there's a nice cake or something in there. <laughs> and then I remember it's my, it's the ashes it's the of my cat. dead cat. Yeah. So it probably was worth the extra money just yeah. for the disappointment. Thing. Oh, well, there'd be a nice cat. Oh no, it's We've some got dead cat. <laughs> got a wee plaque on top of them uh, with their names and stuff like that and it's very beautiful you can make uh, the ashes of I don't know if whether I mean, it must be the same with animals you can make them into press them and make them into little diamonds yeah you and could yeah, yeah you could you're not know, tempted to do no, that no I just like them on the kitchen mantelpiece okay. when I go in in the morning I say hello to all of them you've got a lot of cats eventually I mean A that could bankrupt you yeah <laughs> if you're 600 pounds every yeah. time one dies and plus you know there won't, 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 won't be room on the mantelpiece the thing is it's my wife and people think it's me I do like cats but she's just ro- she's a bit wrong uh, she adopted two new ones when I was at the fringe. She just adopted just when I was away. She just got another couple of them. And I went home the other day and she had one of the kittens. It was Olivia Pope. <laughs> Came home the other day and she had Olivia Pope <coughs> up against her face like that. And she said, do we look like each other? <laughs> it's very difficult to know what to say to someone. <laughs> do we look like each other? Y- yeah. Yeah, you do. That's the answer she wanted. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to say, yeah, you, yeah. Do, you really do. You look like it. You know, so people think it's me. It's not me. I like them. She's... It's wrong. Yeah. Wrong. She sleeps with them under the covers. When I go home, it's awkward. No, in the bed. Because it's like four cats. I'm going to do them. <laughs> oh, can I come in tonight? Oh, no, fine. I'll just sleep on the floor then. <laughs> So, uh, I've been reading your book. <coughs> Have you? Cheer Up Love, yeah? Yeah. I'm a wow. quarter, quarter of the way in. Right. That's basically where I get to, because I start reading it on the day that I'm interviewing someone. <laughs> <laughs> so I get about 80 pages in. Good. Thanks. Uh, and <laughs> if you're really depressed, it's probably a really good read. <laughs> because... Because it's about depression. Um, you say you're a very pessimistic, negative person. Yeah. 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 You must be really enjoying the like, n- world news now. Because <laughs> like, now there's something to actually be pessimistic genuinely about. So if you're that yeah. pessimistic and negative, when things actually get quite negative, does that, is that any worse or does it make you feel better? I, I said person? on the news quiz about four or five weeks ago that Trump was going to win. Right. And everyone said, no, he's not. And I said, no, he is going to win. In the same way as when I went back up to Scotland when Brexit was happening, all my friends were saying, oh, it's not going to happen. I said, no, no, it is going to happen. Because I was touring around the country at that time and I could tell it was going to happen. And I I hate it when I'm right about something as awful as this. But I could tell Trump was going to win. There was absolutely no question he was going to win that election rather than Hillary Clinton. And it's devastating. It was devastating for so many reasons. I, w- I really wanted to believe that America wouldn't vote for a sexist, r- racist misogynist who has admitted sexually assaulting women. I really wanted to believe that. But they would rather vote for that than, than a woman. And uh, what's been quite interesting for me is when all the stuff about Trump has come out about his behavior towards women, some of my friends have been quite shocked. Some of my male friends have been quite shocked. But as many people have said, before me, that behaviour towards women is Monday for some people. And that's the reality of, of what it's like. I've never been more aware of my gender in my entire life than I am right now. Yeah. Because of the discussions that have been happening about women. And the thing is, for me, Trump is not the problem. Trump's an idiot. Trump's a fool. Trump's an absolute buffoon, a total dickhead. He's not the issue. He has taken every position on every issue you can possibly imagine. He is a total 
cock. Mike Pence is one of the most evil people you will ever encounter in your life. That's President Mike Pence to President you by Mike now. President Mike Pence. Anyone that believes in con gay conversion therapy it is just extraordinary because that's something that was happening in Britain. That happened in Britain. Let's not say it didn't happen here, but basically you torture gay people until they assimilate or kill themselves. That's the point of conversion therapy. And he passed a law saying that if a woman had an abortion or a miscarriage, they had to pay for the funeral. This guy will repeal Roe versus Wade. Uh, he is, it is the worst possible thing. And so the only annoying thing about the election is everyone's been laughing at Donald Trump whilst ignoring the fact that behind it is actually one of the most right-wing Republicans you can possibly <laughs> imagine who will destroy gay rights, uh, women's rights, will go for segregation, hates Muslims, hates everyone. And yep. it's really, it's terrifying because for people like me, Richard, I don't hate anyone. And I think the problem is if you're someone like me who doesn't hate people, you feel slightly terrified just now. Uh, because we always apologise for not hating people. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm sorry. I'm left wing. Oh my God, I'm, we must have balance on the show. I'm so, so, I'm so sorry, but I'm so sorry about being left wing. And they don't apologise for hating me because those fucking cunts hate me. Yeah. And uh, the tour I'm going on, I'm going to go around the country and talk about some of these issues. And I'm not sure how as a pro-remain feminist Scottish lesbian it's going to go down in some areas of England. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I have to go around. The only, the only solution I have is to go around and try and put a different viewpoint, which is one actually of positivity and saying, why, why do we hate each other? Why has the rhetoric become so negative in this country and in America that you hate people? People who voted for Brexit, I don't hate them. I would like to try and understand why they voted for Brexit. Mm. But everyone's like, oh, I hate you, you're racist. It's like, they're probably not. There are some racists there. But we've become so bad at political discourse in this country that it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that Donald Trump won or we voted for Brexit. If Nigel Farage, though, appears on another sodding programme <laughs> as an unelected, he's an MEP, but he's never been elected, and that man appears, he met Donald Trump and people are calling him the envoy of Britain. Now, that's terrifying. Yeah. Well, I mean, lots of it's terrifying. I mean, it's nearly all terrifying. It is all terrifying. Um, I mean, is that? I mean, it's sorry, I was just—I needed to say some of that. I apologise. Uh, <laughs> it's difficult to get any positive spin on it, uh, and it I, I'm, I'm quite an optimistic person. I find this terrifying. I wonder whether four years of Trump and or just the other Republicans might galvanise everyone to think, okay, this time we won't do that. This time, we'll, yeah. will, will it make the more liberal elements of America, which is at least half, actually slightly more than half, voted yes. for, for Hillary, obviously around the edges more than in the middle. What needs to happen, though, is it's cyclical. It's cyclical, these things. What needs to happen is there needs to be a, a person in the left, the liberal, the liberal wing of any parties that, that brings people together. And this is what we are, both countries are currently missing. Somebody who's a liberal to come forward and, and say to people, you don't need to do this. This doesn't need to happen. Yeah. And that's what we, what we need here because Jeremy Corbyn uh, is a, a lovely fella. He's a lovely fella. But I'm not entirely sure that he's the one who can galvanize the left as a movement together. And we need somebody to come forward and do that for us so that we feel that we've got somebody i don't know i mean some of you might be trump supporters i don't i don't i'm assuming that because you're here you're not a dickhead but that's a bad assumption to oh right, okay. <laughs> i just I, there just has to be there has to, i think it, this is going to be a great time for comedy in that the alternative comedy scene came out of thatcherism and the bad stuff that was happening and maybe this is for live comedy I really hope this is a kick up the arse that people can start writing some good stuff about what's Although happening. Although he's so, I mean, for Trump, I mean, I worry for American comedians, sort of genuinely, because he's so thin skinned. Well, Wanda about Sykes, anything, did you see Wanda Sykes? Yeah. Who's an out gay black woman, was booed off stage yesterday or a few months ago <laughs> <laughs> by making jokes about Donald Trump at a, a charity event. She was yeah. booed off stage 
for saying that Trump was a racist. And then a, a white guy came on afterwards and made loads of rape jo jokes and got carried out, basically, on people's shoulders. And so, yes, it is dangerous, but, but we, can't, we can't stop doing what we're doing beca no. because of that. No, of course not. And I, I, well, my hope is that it, this is all the last kick of, the, of, that, of that old system, you know what I mean? I think that the, the, it's happened because people because white, middle-class, wealthy men have felt we're the oppressed minority now, incorrectly, and, and, are, and, are, and are standing up, to, you know, and, and making this last stand, and that actually they'll fuck everything up, hopefully, and hopefully mm -hmm. not too badly, and everyone will, the younger people. I mean, it seems to me, in both the UK and America, if it was left up to, if, if younger people voted well, in any numbers, and if, it was if they understood the power they had. Mm -hmm. The reason UKIP have been successful is only because they galvanised enough people to vote. It's not, I, think, I think they managed to get all the people who think that to vote. Yes. And if all the young people, and by young I mean you know, younger than me, <laughs> so not, not even that young, yeah. uh, if, if they all got under together... Under 60. <laughs> yeah, under 60. <laughs> um, <laughs> Then, you know, they, they, that's an amazing... Yeah. The, the only reason that, that anyone's listening to UKIP is because of the, the power they had in the, uh, on the ballot box. Yes. And, it, and if, uh, like, uh, if young people or if everyone in the middle or the liberals in the middle uh, or, you know, or the left-leaning people... But I, I saw the, anyone in the middle, right and left, there's a 70% you know, of our population are in that, in yeah, that basic same circle same and there's nobody for that, them to vote for. No, no. There's the Liberal Party who, you know... And you know they're not, they're not um, the Labour Party is not is is trying to push those people away anyway, mm. and the Conservative Party is pushing in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So seventy percent of the people are being led by the two fifteen percent at either yeah. either end. So it's it's just a it's a re the, so much has happened in this particular year, and I think a lot of people feel quite despondent about what's happening just now, and we just have to kind of not feel despondent. And actually, this is a very empowering time. If you want it to be an empowering time to stand up for what it is that, that we think is what kind of place we want to, to live in. And uh, it's quite strange because in, in Scotland, of course, it was something like 65% voted to stay in Europe. And there is a cult, there are, and London voted to stay in Europe. And there are cult, there are differences everywhere. All I know is that as a, an out lesbo, this is one of the most terrifying times I can remember since Clause 28, Section 28. This is genuinely a fairly frightening time in terms of what's going to happen to uh, me uh, and what's going to happen to in America to people over there because uh, it doesn't look good over there for for LGBT people no. and <coughs> that's that's not a that's not a great thing because Peter Tatchell who I don't always agree with said that gay people are the canaries of equal rights yeah. you see how people treat gay people and then it just filters down to everyone else and that's the, the worry is that they'll start taking away equal marriage then they'll start taking away hiv funding then they start taking away all these things and we're back to the 1970s again mm. god we've gone serious as fuck tonight <laughs> i'll come on I'll, put, I'll do an emergency question about gentles in okay, a second fine. it'll be fine but it's <laughs> it's nice though because i've been living on my own and i've had no one to talk to about this <laughs> It's really nice. I've been hoping someone in a shop might... Someone in Cafe Nero... <laughs> someone, in, someone in Cafe Nero this morning at King's Cross Station said, how are you? And I was like, oh, not good at all. I am not good. <laughs> and she was like, oh, here's your American. I was like, please talk to me. <laughs> please ask me how I am. But I, I, I hope that, that, you know, the, the vast majority of people aren't racist and aren't homophobic and aren't yeah. sexist and yeah. that they will, you know, they're not, they, they won't, wouldn't allow that to happen. I can't, ima I can't imagine... You know, I can't. I can't imagine it changing that much. That I, I think, if anything, the people, especially in America, I think that other other half of America. It's weird that it's just coming down fifty-fifty, and that it seems unfair that if one of them's gone, the other one should go to good. You know, one's gone to evil, so the other one should go to good, yeah. shouldn't it? Rather than both going to evil. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it's, it, it should be shared out. So you've had. We're going to have Brexit, so you have to have Hillary Clinton. I, That's think, what what we, I think the thing we have to guard against is that I remember someone after Brexit saying, I can't understand why Brexit happened. Everyone on my Twitter feed said it was wrong. 
And it's like, if you follow certain people on Twitter, you think, oh, that'll never... And the thing is, that's not reality. That's who you've chosen to follow yeah, yeah. on Twitter. That's not what's actually happening in the world. And Twitter isn't actually reality in the slightest. Right. And so people get all obsessed with social media and everything. And I, none of that matters. That's yeah. not I don't think it's the very reality important. I think, I think, of life. I think you're absolutely right. It's very important to try and understand the other, the other side. You have to. And work out why that's happening. But, that, but I still, with both of these results... If it had gone the other way, it would have been interesting and, and bad in a different way. Very. But I think if it had gone the other I think if I genuinely think if, um, well, A, both Trump and, and Farage both said that they wouldn't accept the results if yes. they lost. So they both, uh, you know, and, they, and this is what Trump was anticipating. He might win the popular vote but lose by the... Trump said he would uh, take the White House by armed force. Yeah. So if he'd lost the election. Neither of them would have accepted. But, but Not when Gerard Butler's <laughs> there, you would, you bastard. <laughs> But it had Remain one. I don't. Remain couldn't have gone. Well, we're remaining. That's it. You all got to shut up now. Yeah. You'd, you've been insane to do that. You would have had to go. Hey, we have to work out why forty-eight percent of the country are that. Well, the the off. only thing I would say is that my experience of referendums is that they're never final. No. In <laughs> Scotland, you may have noticed it's still going on. <laughs> so a referendum as a binary decision does not solve any problems. No. If you ask people yes or no. Whoever loses is never very happy with what happened. No. So. And and you know democracy means they don't have to shut up. I mean it, we, they wouldn't have shut up if they'd gone the other no. way. Uh, and nor should they have had shut up no, if they'd gone the other shut way. Up. And nor should they have been asked the question. To be no. honest, but there we go. <laughs> Fascist. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not. We can't. Do you think decide he was that. wrong to ask the question? I think to, it was wrong. To, not not in, not in Remain Brexit. Right. I think in Scotland. I think Scott stay in Scotland, Scotland independent or not independent. Yeah. That's a, that's a reasonable yeah. question. But you don't because there's Cameron only there's only two options. Yeah. Rem, remain and, and exit Brexit. There's already five or six options. Yes. Of what Brexit means. Yeah. Right, so it, that wasn't a binary decision. And Why it wasn't are we not replacing Andrew Marr on a Sunday and morning? It, it That's the only question we I have at this point. We weren't qualified time. to make the... You know, we weren't qualified. No one was qualified, really, to make that decision. And that's no. why you have politicians to make those decisions. Yeah, really. good point. Uh, so I think it was a, a dumbass, stupid... You know, David Cameron... It's David Cameron's fault. David Cameron should not have agreed to do that in order to keep his party together. Now, Theresa May is having to carry on saying something she doesn't actually think in order to try and keep her party yeah. together. Yeah. So fuck it. Anyway, let's ask. I'll ask you this question. <laughs> this this will this will change things. <laughs> if you had to do a human centipede with two other people, <laughs> you are in the middle. But you can choose who the other two people are. <laughs> who'd be ahead of you and who'd be behind you? Do you know what a human centipede is, Susan? I've not watched it, but no. I understand the concept. <laughs> you, uh, can I ask? Yeah. Because I haven't seen it. Is my mouth sewn to the oh, anus? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> not just stuck on with sellotape. What would have you just pull it away, couldn't you? <sighs> okay. But having said that, I don't understand why they don't just get some nail scissors and just cut the thread off. They've still got hands, haven't they? Why don't they just go and get some nails? Is that? Go. We're I out of here. They like being in the human centipede. That's all I'm... That's what, once they're in, they like it. They go, no, we could cut this off now. I like it. I would have... Do you want to know the yeah, answer? I do want to know the answer. Of course, I wouldn't have asked the question. Gillian Anderson in front. All right, that's quite good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm trying to think. I can't see anyone I know in case I meet them. <laughs> so I'm going to no. I'll say Helen Mirren. Helen Mirren. Behind eating you, the mixed shit of you and Gillian Anderson. Yeah. Wow. I thought you liked her. <laughs> It's not who I actually want, but I, I don't want to see anyone I know because it will become awkward. Okay. I, well, I wanted Claire Balding, but, you know, okay. I know her. Okay. She won't listen to this, actually. So I'd like Claire Balding. <laughs> Claire Balding on the back. Claire Balding in the back. Yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> Seems like you're imagining tasting then. <laughs> Claire Balding in the back and Perkins in the front. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Um, have you ever met Brian Blessed? 
No. Oh. <laughs> I just figured everyone had met Brian Blessed no, and would have an Brian amazing Blessed. story no, about it. No, I've never met him. It'd be amazing if you met Brian Blessed. I've seen him I'm, on the television. I'm going to make that happen. I met Miriam Margulies. Oh, yeah, well, that's like, that's like the female Brian She's Blessed. <laughs> filthy. Yeah. Well, in a real filthy. lady. Filthy. Like, really, like, <coughs> filthy. What did she say? She was talking about having a pubic hair caught in her teeth just before we went on stage <laughs> in a radio show. She was like, yeah, darling, I had pussy hair there. And I went, what the fuck? <laughs> Filthy old laser. Yeah. Cut that out. I don't know if she's out. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been in a canoe? Yeah. Yeah, how was it? my favourite thing. What, what happened? Where were you canoeing? Uh, I was canoeing at Loch Goyle Head when I was at school. It may have been a kayak. I'm, I'll allow that. I'm going to allow it. What's the difference? Um, one's a palindrome. <laughs> <laughs> I think the canoes for one person are kayaks for more than one person. Yeah. Any... What, no, she's wrong, or no, we don't, we don't know the answer? Kayak has a top, and you can do an Eskimo roll. David through. David through. I have been in a canoe then. Yeah, that's good. And I didn't really enjoy it in the same way as I don't really enjoy skiing or horse riding. No. I don't enjoy anything that you can't really hold a drink and a fag at the same time. <laughs> I find them pointless pursuit. Is it, race, is it racist to say Eskimo, Eskimo yeah. roll now? I think it probably is. I think David's is. free is probably racist. Uh, so that's... <laughs> if you said Inuit roll, yeah. it'd be better. I think it's still racist to imply that Inuit people would roll over in a kayak. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of stereotyping them, isn't it? So we have to apologise to any Inuit listeners... Oh yeah. yeah, trigger warning. Trigger, Should have given trigger a trigger warning. warning. Well, I was—we were talking about this brief, briefly backstage, but you're on the Guilty Feminist podcast, which is a fantastic podcast. Great podcast. Like they, sl they care slightly more about that kind of thing than I do. Yeah. Trigger warnings everywhere. Yeah. Trigger warning. Trigger warning. Trigger warning. And it seemed you were slight. You got slightly annoyed by having got to apologise for every. I enjoy. I enjoy them. Uh, Sophie Hagen's wonderful. And Deborah Francis White is gorgeous. And I like being on this po podcast because, as I said, this is kind of the opposite of the Guilty Feminist podcast. This is very much the antidote <laughs> to that podcast. Because I am proud to be a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept apologising all the time and saying, uh, if, if you have suffered this, then we apologise. Of course, what we mean is all people, not just straight people and, and cisgendered people and everything else. I'm, I'm down with that. I'm down with sexual politics, completely down with it. But you know what? Sometimes it interrupts a conversation. And sometimes... Um, so they kept apologising, so I kind of lost my mind a little bit and started apologising <laughs> if you were dead and listening to the podcast and if I'd upset you because you'd, you weren't listening to the podcast. And, <laughs> and sometimes it just, it, sometimes I think that, that feeds into the paranoia and the right wing that we're all so wishy-washy that we're all just like, oh, hey, I'm so... And, and you know, sometimes, sometimes I make mistakes, sometimes I'm not a good feminist. Um, I, uh, in my show that I'm doing just now, uh, someone left a message on my Facebook fan page that said, I, I like her, I, mean, I just wish she would stop using the term wife to describe her partner. We don't need patriarchal terms of oppression in 2016. Um, essentially saying I was a rubbish feminist because I had a wife, yeah. because I was buying into the patriarchy. And that just really annoys me because I've fought for years for equal marriage and she is my wife as far as I'm concerned. I'm not buying into the patriarchal terms of oppression. So I go through lots of... Uh, ideas of what I could call her which would make feminists happy with me because I hate disappointing feminists <laughs> and uh, I end up saying I'll call her Tits McGee because that's <laughs> I mean I think it's an, I, I, I just want you know as you say I think you could just say at the beginning of any podcast you know we treat everyone equally <laughs> Regardless, and if we upset anyone, we're sorry. We don't mean to. I do really that. try not to upset people, yeah, yeah. but it's human nature to upset people. Sometimes you say things and you just you upset someone, and that's just 
You know, as long as you're not aggressively trying to upset somebody. Well, comedy's like, you know, comedy will always upset someone. Any joke, you, the most innocuous joke someone will be upset about. So you, can't, you can't live your life by worrying about that. And we also have to develop a, a slightly thicker skin, I think, as, as individuals. But I wonder whether... I just wonder whether the kind of level that it goes to, it seems to, to a normal person, like a regular per Trump voter, I think that sort of stuff must just seem... And I'd like to apologise for calling them a normal person, because obviously all people are normal. Uh, but it just seems... There's no such thing as a normal person. No. But it must, uh, it must seem crazy. It just makes, uh, it makes a nice thing seem too crazy, that they, have yeah. to, that they have to be worrying that they're going to trip over themselves and say the wrong yeah. thing, that they'll be castigated and, and chastised for, for saying something that they don't yeah. actually mean, that you know, if you're a decent person. So I wonder whether that, all that extreme, the more extreme kind of left-wing stuff actually has a negative effect and helps you know it feels like with trump a lot of it was about um making the media all seem bad and evil and, and making everything up that's how the, that's how he's managed to get that working which you can understand because the media lies about loads of stuff yes. so lots of the newspapers i don't know if it's true in america but certainly here the papers are full of lies so if you can go well the papers are full of lies then, then you can say, well, all the papers are full of lies and nothing, you can't trust anything from the media. Openly gay ex-fencer. Still yeah. my favourite thing that's ever happened in the Daily Mail. <laughs> Imagine being an openly gay ex-fencer of all the fucking disgusting things. <laughs> Imagine representing your country, then studying for a degree and becoming an eminent judge and being openly gay at the same time. It is the most revolting. I vomited on my own <laughs> face when I saw that. In Imagine, imagine having the temerity in 2016 to not be ashamed of your sexuality. What a fucking dickhead he is. <laughs> Do you know, imagine parading up and down as a gay person in 2016. Quite right, Daily Mail. <laughs> Fuckers. So, that kind of thing. That kind of thing makes you distrust the media and so therefore you can flip it around and just believe everything you read on the internet or, de or decide that or decide that you, do, you, do, you believe nothing. So people are so worried about being made to... I think Trump's works. People are so worried about being made to look foolish by believing something that isn't true that they sort of will believe but anything. the problem is then people, people don't ask questions. I, I spoke to my friend Bethany Black, you know Bethany yeah, Black, a yeah. uh, transgender lesbian comedian who was on Banana and all that kind of stuff. And I don't understand some of the stuff about cisgendered and all that kind of stuff. I don't get I don't understand it, so I spoke to her about it. But sometimes you don't have anyone to speak to about it, so you just worry about not knowing what you're talking about, the definitions of what these... So you just don't say anything, and then it, no one has a conversation because yeah. they're worried about upsetting people with what they say. Yeah, but then I think by not talk, by saying, oh, you're not allowed to say that, yeah. then it just means people think, oh, well, I'm not allowed to say it, but I'll still think it. You can't... Yeah. It's not, and so then, and then I'm allowed to do this in the ballot box. I can, no one knows what I'm saying in the ballot box, so I can tick whatever Absolutely. I want in it. Absolutely. So I think, I, you know, by, by shutting people down, I mean, it's the, it's the lack of freedom of speech and it's the fact that you're not but even allowed to discuss you it. If you're wrong, Richard, we can discuss things. I'm going to throw in a controversial yeah. grenade into this Go conversation on, where I'm one. going to ask you a question okay. about you. Yeah. <laughs> not you, necessarily, but about comedy. Yeah. Do you not think, and this is... Uh, Believe me, something I have thought about. Do you not think that the fact, for example, that every travel log that's created is uh, men, so only men can travel, so all the travel logs on television are two men, uh, every topical show is hosted by a man, now, especially since Sandy left the news quiz, um, Mock the Week has one woman who's allowed on it. Do you not think that the world being seen through the eyes of white straight men is one of the problems we have? that you don't hear of any other issues. So for example, in Belfast, gay marriage is still not allowed, but we don't hear anything about that because that's not important to a white straight man. Do you not think that one of the problems about discourse in this country is that we hear the same sodding things on television every single night from white straight men who don't care about anyone else? I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely... Uh it's definitely true. Oh, yeah, it is true. And, and they won't let me on, and I'm a good one. So <laughs> let's... Uh... <laughs> I just think it, it, America, and I mean, they, they obviously it went wrong for them, but uh, if you look at their topical comedy, and a lot of them are men, but I count John Oliver as very much a different breed of gentleman in that he gets a lot of what's going on. But Samantha B. If you've not seen Samantha B, she is doing some of the best comedy I've ever seen in my entire life. And when she talks about 
uh, Mike Pence, she really talks about it because she's talking about something that, that matters. So we don't hear about repeal the eighth campaigns very much, which is about Irish uh, women's reproductive rights. We don't hear about you know Northern Ireland. We don't hear about those kind of things because the narrative is is set by people who don't really care. I think it's definitely, and I think it's definitely true that you know it's ridiculous that, that there isn't more variety of, of uh, and diversity within TV. But also, I think TV in the UK is just much too bland about all of these subjects anyway. It's, so it's bland about so everything. It's, yeah, it's bland so about it's, everything. So that in America, like you say, John Oliver is doing a, v- a very intelligent show uh, and really discussing the but issues. But this isn't a moan about television. No. This is about why we as a country went into the Brexit situation and think that everyone who's brown is evil. Because we don't, we don't, I mean, trigger warning, if someone, two women are on a show or two black people are on a show, we don't see, the country that we see is not the country that exists. And therefore, people become alienated about what's happening because we are not seeing the reality of what's happening on television. Yeah. And I, it, it frustrates me that people in the media are so surprised that things happen when actually they're complicit in what's happening. I mean, I think the BBC needs to be balanced, but they didn't need to put Marie Le Pen on on Remembrance Sunday, did they? Uh, did they I need to put the leader of the fascists? It was, not, it was very, it was very bad timing. I, 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 I it feel, was very bad timing. I feel, uh, Thanks, BBC Complaints Department. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that she should be... To be fair, it was bad timing, but, you know, balance in the BBC is very important, so we thought we'd have the leader of the fascists and, you know... The problem with it is, I think everyone should be allowed to speak, because I think... We're going to get naked in a minute and start wrestling, aren't we? I think think everyone should be allowed to speak. I think the actual, one of the big... Oh, they should be, yes. One of the big problems is that a a show of any kind will go, we'll get balance, so we'll get one person who thinks this extreme thing, and one person who thinks this extreme thing, and one person in the middle... That's not mathematical, right? You don't, you don't get this. That's not balanced because uh, it's a, it's a bell curve, isn't it? So most yeah. people are in the middle. If it was balanced, there'd be t- ten people in the middle. Well, you know, you'd have to have t- 20, 30 people in the middle, and then one person and one person. So if you, every single discussion thing has a Farage on one end and you know t- mm-hmm. Colvin on the other, and then one useless liberal in the middle, that. That doesn't. <laughs> One used to liberal. I still don't even know the fucking name of the leader of the liberals. Tim Harris or something he's called. <laughs> I think he's called Tim. <laughs> that doesn't represent. That doesn't say that. It, you feel you're being balanced, but you're not I being balanced. I can't remember because, his name either. Because you do. <laughs> That's from Tim Farron. Farron. Like little pocket lip dames. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle but there. then it makes you think oh like loads of people think this because every week I turn on the TV and every week Nigel Farage is on TV and every week yeah. he's saying the same thing so loads of people must think that and I just don't think that's no. that. and so it's sort of self-fulfilling prophecy as yeah. well you know so that's that's the problem with it. that's one of the problems with balance but yeah of course you get comedians saying oh you know when, when Andrew Lance was talking about the ethnic comedians and women posing as comedian um you know, you kind of go, really? Do you genuinely think there's only, you know, the, the, out of all the Asian people in the country, none of them are funny? That yeah. like, and in fact, only one or two of them are funny because that's the only thing you get on TV. So you think those two people are being propelled forwards because that nobody else is funny. That's insane, right? There, yeah. there, there are funny people. <laughs> that funniness doesn't go along any kind of boundaries like that. No. So the fact there are only two people, is, it's the opposite you should be learning from that, going, well, this is insane. Why aren't there... You know, why aren't there many, many more? Mm-hmm. And so that, that's the thing you should be taking from that. But so, yeah, there's, there's definitely this... It's not necessarily... It's not a moan about, uh, about the gender diversity. Until it's just about... It's just about why we haven't talked about some of these things before and why some issues are... Why people feel disenfranchised because they're not recognising anything on television that they, that they can relate to in terms of their life. Yeah. And that's why live comedy, which I think to a certain extent has been... It's been in a pretty bad state uh, in a lot of places, not necessarily London where the bright lights are, but around the country comedy clubs are closing, that maybe this is a time for a resurgence in live comedy where we can start talking about things. Yeah. Good luck with that. So, uh, (laughs) see how that goes. I'm about to set off on a journey around the country on tour (laughs) to talk to people in places that fundamentally dislike everything I stand, like everything, even more than you, Richard. Yeah. I am essentially the wicker man ready to be burnt by these people <laughs> because I'm a big dyke 
from a country where they hate Nicola Sturgeon and independence and I love Europe to my bones and I'm going to stand in front of them and go let's all look. I'm going to soften the blow with some chat about cats yeah right and then I'm going to <laughs> straight in with the how you know where are the, where are the uh, where are the Brexit comedians you know where the, if if 52% of people vote for Brexit where are the comedians representing those I people? really don't care <laughs> <laughs> people kept saying oh we don't have anyone on any comedians on to talk about Brexit I really don't give a shit because all I saw on television were people who believed in Brexit and if people believe I, I've not really met a comedian that I met one comedian who thinks that Brexit was a good idea we didn't go on <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> Uh, let's talk about your time as a lawyer. It might still be... be uh, Lighten things up a bit. Yeah. It's going to be quite a serious topic, but it, we'll get Sorry, to... Sorry, I, I just... I, no, moments. actually, don't. Stop fucking apologising. Apologise. For being liberal, Susan, you stupid <laughs> shit. That's exactly what I was talking about. Oh, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about saying that I don't hate people and I think we should all talk more about these things. For fuck's sake, this is my problem. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I go on the news quiz and I talk about not hating and sexism. I'm so sorry. Stop saying sorry! The fucking right wing to go, oh, I hate everyone! And I'm like, I'm so sorry about that, I'm so sorry, I'm so liberal. I'm so sorry I'm an intelligent woman with a, an opinion. I'm so sorry, I must have a smile more. Fuck it! Well, I'm glad you finally apologised, that's all I can say. So it's all I can say. Let's talk about you. you made, this is an amazing decision you made in your life. You were a successful lawyer. Yes. Uh, <laughs> We're bringing out a line of Susan Kalman nodding. I am, duck I am using a straw, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. because I was coming uh, to this podcast tonight and I put lipstick on for you, Richard. Oh, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> All a flutter. I don't know. I can carry on. Yep. You were a, co you're a corporate lawyer. Yep. And then you decided to become a comedian, so you yep. took left behind a successful job. Yep. Money, pension. Yeah. <laughs> and and you, well, you had quite. You, and well, this was presumably before you were alive. When, when you went, you were in America. Was, was this sort of part of the university training, or was this just in your? What, was this, when you went to America and were dealing with people on death row, was that when you were working as a lawyer? No, I was at university and yeah. I got the Judge Brennan scholarship to go and work in uh, North Carolina with uh, prisoners on death row, yeah. serial killers on death row, and. I, uh, the Appellate Centre was to try and get people's sentences commuted from death to life without parole. Um, everyone I worked with did it. There was no miscarriages of justice. They all did it. Uh, but I fundamentally am against capital punishment because I'm sorry, I'm a liberal. <laughs> and I went to, I worked with one client who used to, so I was 20, been in Glasgow, went across, all bright eyed and bushy tailed. And I went into the maximum security prison in Raleigh and uh, uh, I met a client and what he used to do was he would knock on trailer park doors and if, they were with, if the woman answered and they were blonde, he'd let them live and if they were dark haired and dark eyed, he would kill them. And they sent me in without telling me this <laughs> <laughs> because he was killing his mother repeatedly was the point. And they sent me in to see how he reacted. <laughs> did, did he kill you? Is the, is the question from the, from the audience. It was very silent. It was silence of the lambs, perspex screen, and all that, that kind of uh, malarkey. And then I went up to the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia to interview a prison guard who'd slept with one of the prisoners when he was in prison. And I was talking to her, just having a conversation with her, and she just leaned over and said, just to let you know, I've got a, a loaded gun under the table and it's pointed at you. And I said, that's probably enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> and they went up to a trailer park and had a shotgun pointed at me and stuff like that. Nice. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Blimey. So, uh, what, was that why you left being a lawyer? But that's before you became a lawyer. I left being a lawyer because I, uh, I enjoy law. I enjoy the theor theoretical application of law. I enjoy the mental aspect of law. Apologies if you're mental. And I... <laughs> Uh, I didn't like the legal profession. The legal profession were confused by me and uh, who I was, because especially Scots law, you were 
generally straight and your boyfriend was a rugby player or your girlfriend you know played hockey and it was very kind of you know normal lovely and I was this little kind of weirdo dyke who wore trouser suits and a uh, tank girl boots and they didn't like me very much to be honest and I didn't really like them and I thought, if I don't get, if I don't leave law, I'll go mad. I'll go, you know, absolutely stark, uh, raving mad if I don't leave. So I, I resigned, and earned no money for about five years. So, but you thought um, you resigned and going to become a comedian? I did. My, I did an open spot at the Stand Comedy Club, five minutes, and then six months later, walked into my boss's office, slammed <laughs> a letter of resignation on his desk, and said, I'm going to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 10 years later, I am almost breaking even <laughs> at times. <laughs> uh, but it was the bit, it was the, I'm a very controlling person, as you know, Rich, yeah. from our relationship. <laughs> and <laughs> it's the only impulsive decision I've ever made in my life. It's the only thing I've ever done, and I don't know why I did it, apart from the fact I've, since I saw uh, an audience with Victoria Wood in 1987, which I used to know off by heart, I looked at that and, and I thought she was the most remarkable, beautiful, wonderful woman I've ever seen. And she was a bit weird. She used to wear tweed jackets and ties and stuff yeah. like that. And she wasn't like the woman you saw on television. And I thought she was so funny and so brilliant. I just wanted to be like Victoria Wood. That's all I wanted in life. Was to be, and my one huge regret in comedy, I've met all of my heroes, but I never met her. And, ooh, uh, I went to her memorial, and it was, uh, she was wonderful. And I just wish I'd, uh, I did meet her <laughs> at the Chortle Awards, and I was so nervous, and tearing in, uh, said to her, my friend here's a big fan, do you want your photograph taken with her? And it was in, in the days, to be honest with you, before smartphones. So I don't know where the photo is. Because oh. I took it on like an old kind of Nokia or something like that. And I don't know. So uh, there is a photograph of me, but I don't know where it is. Of me and uh, the legend. Oh. Yeah. Can't do anything about it, can we? She's dead. <laughs> no. She's dead. <laughs> So she's, she's why I wanted to do it. Yeah. Who, who was, what was the reason you wanted to do it? Um, I've always just really liked comedy. I mean, I like Rick Mayo, so there we go. So it's, like, it's the curse of being the person who inspires you to do something is an early death. Uh, but uh, she's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, got his, uh, I've got his ashes to learn on the mantelpiece. <laughs> 600 quid it was, but I feel it was worth it. <laughs> I had to dig him up and... Uh, I you know. I, I, like, it's, I, I really, I've always just loved comedy. But the, those, the, it is really weird. I, I was stood behind Rick Mayer in a petrol station once and couldn't speak to him. Yeah. And I saw Victoria Wood uh, uh, weirdly when we went to um, we were invited to Buckingham Palace for a charity thing, and, and Victoria Wood was one of the other guests. <laughs> and I was too nervous to talk to her. But my wife went and said hello oh to really? her. She was written. This was like last year, but you know. Do you get invited to Buckingham Palace a lot? No, I don't. <laughs> it was quite unusual. I've never been. No, it was. I had dinner with Princess Anne. Did you? Yeah, Just was, the two of you? I was, <laughs> I was shoved down the one end of the table. I got right. quite a late invitation to this thing. I think they didn't have enough. Do you know what I've never understood about Princess Anne? Yeah, what? Why she bothers being with that horrible family when she's quite nice? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she has very long hair she only ever wears in a bun. I don't understand the point yeah. of that. I can never look at her without thinking, you never put that down. Why don't you just cut it? <laughs> Do you know what I bet she does no, when she there's gets. No. I think in the old days, women should, you know, all better have long hair. So, and but it, I saw her the other day, like in a picture, and I was like, "Why don't you just cut it, love?" It's because when she stopped a day of being a princess, she gets back home and goes, <gasps> "Doesn't it?" <laughs> Do you know? Yeah, that's what it's for. That's all I can think about when I see her. Is why didn't she just cut her hair? I can't. I can't. I'll get her on and I'll ask her. Yeah. So if, if she hears what I said about her brother, she might not come on. Oh, it's um. <laughs> Which one? Which brother? Uh, it was the Andrew was the one I was what talking about. What did you about. say? Well! <laughs> Sorry, I didn't... What did you say? I was when I was talking to Sophie Hagen, I made some accusations there. What? <laughs> Looking at my producer there, he's now... No, I, I genuinely don't, don't, don't know. I again. genuinely do. I can't... Yeah, well, I just made a load of stuff up. I just made a load of stuff up. <laughs> Back from being a... <laughs> it's... Um, <laughs> It was just made up stuff. 
Did it get broadcast? No, of course not. But if you uh, if you get the Kickstarter channel for this uh, for this, if you pay, you can get to the Kickstarter channel, I think, for this. But if you paid on the Kickstarter, you can see the unedited version of that. Well, you could call him up. Yeah. Well, I call him all sorts of things. <laughs> Should we go through them again, Ben, or what? Do you wanna... Why don't you just put a load of beeps on this anyway? I'll go. Why do you not like him? Uh, it was just a joke. It was because so. Oh, it was a joke. Was, yeah, well, and also he is. A <laughs> it's, it's, uh... <laughs> Sophie didn't know who he was, and I'd forgotten that he existed, and so I just. Uh, I, I was trying to tell her about our royal family, so I was just. Can like... I just warn you about Sophie Hagen? Because I know her. I think she sometimes pretends to to not <laughs> know things, In so order. that so that people will like say things like that about yeah. I think she, she knows fine well and then she goes to the police I don't even think she's Danish <laughs> <laughs> I think it's all an act just to get more publicity yeah, could be true you know like, I could talk to you forever and I might do uh, last the, one, the last time we did this was one of the longest podcasts we did it went yeah. on for a long time I listened to it today and I thought god oh, bloody hell <laughs> uh, it was good though it was good uh, but it was very long and uh, you know there's a lot of things to talk to you about uh, so, I will do well, this. Well, ask me things and I'll be briefer in my answers. No, no, it's good. Like I, I like I'll, I'm going to go through. Have you seen your YouGov part? Have you seen the page on YouGov where they tell you what your fans are like? Have you seen this? This is something no. I've been looking at. No, on you YouGov, didn't look, did they you? do. They, they, you can look up someone and see their fans and they'll tell you what makes the, the fans uh, unique right, from and other you've fans. You've looked at mine, have you? I've looked at your fans. No. Uh, your fans' favourite food is milk tart. <laughs> <laughs> A milk tart. I don't know is. what a milk tart is. It doesn't look very nice. There's a picture of it on the website. A milk tart. Milk tarts. <laughs> Can I have a tart? Oh no, no, not an apple tart. Could you make me a tart out of milk, please? Is that possible? Yes, I would imagine so. Why don't you give it a go? That's <laughs> quite a runny tart. I am going to ask people when I go on tour if anyone likes a milk tart. Yeah, that's what your fans like. The niche interests of your fans is the 2003 Iraq War. That is the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love Susan Cowman, and I also like the war. Just the 2003 Iraq War. I don't want to go to the earlier Iraq War. Those are my two interests. Can you bring out a magazine? Susan Cowman, the 2003. Their most likely pet is a cat. That's well, oh, that okay. did not surprise that's, me. That's fine. Their favourite TV show is not only but also the Peter Cook and Dudley Moore show from the 1960s. <laughs> Did they just interview people in a care home? <laughs> and your fans have £125 to £499 uh, monthly spare, which isn't too bad. That's my fans have over a thousand pounds spare a month. No, they do. Look, but yours you, I, I, very right, specifically, okay. one hundred and twenty-five, one hundred ninety-nine. I do not believe yeah. that your fans <laughs> have more money than my. They fans. do. They're wealthier than yours. No, I genuinely do not believe. They've got that. money to spare. They might earn less, but they might they might not spend as much. So they've got. No, they might be misers. I no, I I am looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> and these might be your people. Fans. Are, uh, do not have more money to spend than the people who come and see me. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't see how you, Gov, would lie about that. <laughs> Your fans lost, watch less than one hour of television a week. Well, that's shit. <laughs> <laughs> As if they're all listening to Radio 4, to Moneybox Live on the Moral Maze. <laughs> Did you hear a thought for the day today? I thought it was very... Uh, fuck's sake. <laughs> So I'll, do, I'll whisk through a couple of other things and yep. then we better go. Yeah. Um, you were on Loose Ends recently with Cliff Richard. How did that go? Because <laughs> there's a couple of things I'd like to tell you about Cliff Richard. It was uh, fine, thank you. Yeah, how is he? Is he, is, how is he getting on? Because he's had a bad all couple right. of years, hasn't he? Seems to be all right. Yeah. yeah. Did he bounce back? <laughs> Yep. Okay. <laughs> you were on with Cliff Richard, Jane Horrocks, and Hedy Re H Harry Redknapp. Yeah, it was quite the afternoon. Did you go? To, did you go to the pub with them afterwards? I went to the pub with Cliff Richard. Did you? <laughs> I went to the pub with Cliff Richard. Yeah. Uh, the only time I've had more fun after I went to the pub with Una Stubbs once. Oh, did you? Yeah. She's she's good. Yeah. Cliff was a bit more remote. Right. <laughs> as he was sitting in the BBC club with pizza and. Uh, Cocktail sausages in front of him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 
He, he, has such he seemed like a very nice man. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> he, he, he is suing the BBC just now. He yeah. has lawyers who, you know... Um, He's never going to listen to this, though, Susan, let's face it. And, you know, you can, if, you, if you say something, if you can always defend yourself against him with your lawyer training. <laughs> You're free, so you don't be free. He seemed like a very nice man. Yeah. And uh, he sang very beautifully. Oh, gee, yeah. And my, my mother was delighted because Christmas doesn't start until Cliff starts in our house. That's true. Does your mum get the, calen- the Cliff Richard calendars? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> They're quite, they're quite something. My, my, my mum got given, my niece gave my uh, mum one of those as a joke for Christmas one year. But he's, they're, quite, they're quite fruity, aren't they? Topless cliff. What I'll say is <laughs> that I genuinely enjoy the one time my wife said she might leave me <laughs> was when I also bought a Cliff Richard CD. <laughs> Because I think Christmas isn't Christmas without mistletoe and wine. Yeah. And I put it on and I go around the house singing, <laughs> Christmas time, silent night. <laughs> and she said, she just put it off and said, I'm leaving you. <laughs> sure, the Lord's Prayer one's the worst. The, the I don't like that one as much. That's the worst one. I don't like that one as much, but I, I don't mind them. Miss Stonewine's nice. Yeah. <laughs> he did it. So, uh, it's, um... <laughs> he did mistletoe wine, that's what it's... That's... <laughs> the knee, I think they was... I think I'm right about that. So, uh, it's... <laughs> Any other quick fires you want to get in? Let's have a look. Uh, well, I, was, I enjoyed Top Class. Do you hosting Top Class? I watched a bit of that. It was good. That's another children's BBC show. That's good. Then there's another series of that in the pipeline. Well, we did two, so hopefully we'll do another couple of series of that. Yeah, it's like top of the form, but like it's a bit kind of cooler. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether you're being disparaging about my cho- my career on I'm children's not. TV. Are you being disparaging? No, about that why you just assume that. Well, the way you see it. <laughs> I'm not even like, on TV I, at you all. You always go like, oh, I really enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> You go on top class. <laughs> and Susan. Instead of I'm just going, you said, going, Oh, I really enjoyed you on top class, Susan. You go, <laughs> <laughs> To make it obvious to everyone that, that you're essentially taking the piss out of me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't seem sincere, Richard, <laughs> that I, I could have a career as a children's TV presenter. I'm a role model for children all around this country. Do they think you're just a, a ch- <laughs> child? <laughs> And they look and go, oh, well, you know, maybe I could get my own TV show, like that other, that other kid has managed to do. <laughs> I, think that's, I think that's part of the success. Any other questions? Uh, <laughs> did you work on with Tracy Ullman? Were you on the Tracy Ullman show? Yeah, I was. Yeah, how was see, that? see how you said that? Yeah. That was with some respect. <laughs> it was with Tracy Ullman. Did you work on the Tracy Ullman <laughs> show? Yes, I did. Because that's not like working with a load of school kids and Mrs. Dodds, <laughs> their teacher. It was a... Uh, what did you do with Tracy Ullman? did a sketch with her. Where did I played you perform a, in a sketch with her? I did. I performed in a sketch with her. And I played a Hungarian waitress. Did <laughs> you? And she played uh, somebody who did a ghost tour in Edinburgh. She's a very good Scottish accent. Oh. She's very good at it. And she was in three of a kind, so you know. I bought all of her albums. I've still got her albums. I used to... If I'm very honest, and she won't listen to this, uh, Tracy Element was my first uh, lady crush. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she, she's annoyed about not being in The Simpsons. She sued them. Did she? Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she sued them for money. Because The Simpsons started out as being like a little short inside the Tracy Ullman show and all the other people who were in it were just the, the supporting artists in the Tracy Ullman show who did the voices mm. for The Simpsons. Mm-hmm. And then The Simpsons so arguably went on to be more successful than yes. the Tracy Ullman I show. I would say arguably. Arguably. Yeah. <laughs> no, I really fancied her. Yeah. And then I met her and she's still quite nice. Yeah. And so I just kind of stood awkwardly. <laughs> 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 just staring at her in quite a sinister fashion. Did you remember David Copperfield from Three of a Kind? Yeah. Yeah. 
So. <laughs> I am the whim. So, uh, do you remember Paul Squires? The no. comedian Paul Squires. Who's that? He was around about the same time as a comedian. He was on all the time. Right. Just whenever I think of David Copperfield, I think of Paul Squires. Right. It's just my own personal thing. Does he do this a lot? <laughs> <laughs> Just see where it goes. naming people from like the past and saying, do you remember them? <laughs> <laughs> do you remember, um, <laughs> do you remember Freddo's, the chocolate bar Freddo's? Oh yeah, that's yeah. we give them out on top class yeah. to the kids. I had, I had one on the way here. Did you? Yeah, I'm remembering it now. Yeah. <laughs> they still have them. They're, They're quite good. nice Freddo's, yeah. I don't mind them. They used to have a joke on them. Did they? Yeah, on the, on the package in 1973. That's when I kind of first got into the Freddo. You joke. do kind of just look like like a guy just talking at a bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember Fredo's? Do you remember? I remember they used to have a joke on them. We don't anymore. It's a bus now, isn't it? Remember Paul Squires? Do you remember my Auntie Jean? <laughs> she gave me a Fredo Easter egg, and I still remember it. Did she? Yeah. Really? It's great. I love Fredo. <laughs> They're twenty-five. That's like thirty p for a Fredo now. Does someone come on and take hey, you back? Hey, hey, <laughs> 30p for a Freddo. I remember when Freddo's were like... Just your wife and see that you're still I remember when Freddo's were like, what, 1p or something, or 2p. Wow. Now 3p, maybe. Wow. Well, and now they're 30p. What's that about? That's scandalous, isn't it, Richard? Only a bit of chocolate. <laughs> that means in the shape of a frog. Yeah. I'd pay 30p if there was a joke in it. Yeah. yeah. It's like, um, the jokes were like, <laughs> where does a frog leave its coat when right. it goes to the nightclub? In croak, the croak, in the croak, croak room. Croak yeah. room. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not as good as my one, is it? Where does a bird leave its sexual organs when it goes to a nightclub? In the cloaca room. That is a better. That's a better joke. Don't, don't clap. Don't clap. <laughs> <laughs> Gets better the more I tell it that joke. So uh, it's the the more you hear it, the better it becomes. Well, we you know it's been lovely, but we can't you know we can't go on all night. No. Nope. But we can. <laughs> but we're not going to. But we could. Shall I ask you another emergency question? Yeah, go can on. Dig away. I've already, already asked you about the ghosts. I'll try and find another. I'll get to the. I've written 500 emergency questions. I'm hoping to bring it out as. Uh, as uh, it's going to kickstart books coming out soon, hopefully. Um, another, another Kickstarter book. Yeah, no, there's, there's all you these. Know. I give out lots of nice, uh, nice things to people. Um, uh, have you ever been in a police car? <laughs> <laughs> you must have been in a police car. You're a lawyer. That's a bad question. Um, I wasn't. Why? Have you ever been Why? in a police because car? Because I was a lawyer, I'd be in a police car. That's that makes no sense, Richard. <laughs> the police you say, don't get arrested you with lift? your client at the same time. <laughs> oh, I'm just hanging around with someone who's a bit bad news, for so when they get arrested, I can go straight with them to the police <laughs> station. You don't get... You, that's, that's not what happens, Richard. How would you get them to work? Don't you just hang around the back? You don't phone the police and say, can I go to work, Mr. Policeman? <laughs> I've never been in the back of a police car. Okay. In the front of a police car? No! Okay. Just as odd that you said I've never been in the back of a police car. <laughs> well... You could just say I've never been in a police I've car. I've never been in a police <laughs> car. I have. <laughs> have you... I'm not even a lawyer, so that's amazing. Have you... Have you ever met a shepherd? <laughs> in real life? Yes. How was that? Right. Was, was it a man or a woman shepherd? Man shepherd. How many sheep did he look after? He had quite a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, how did you meet him? Well, I, I used to stay on a farm okay. when I was on holiday and okay. got sheep. What was his name, the shepherd? I'm not going to say his name. Okay. So his, was he the one person that he had? <laughs> Come on. Good, this is interesting <laughs> shepherds, aren't they? Um, Come on. Hold on, I'll get you. A couple more. Couple more. What's this one? This is rubbish. Would you rather have an elbow made out of marshmallow or a foot that transformed into a werefoot every full moon? <laughs> werefoot. Yeah. That would be quite dangerous. Yeah, but, but if your elbow was constantly made of marshmallow, yeah. then you couldn't do anything with your arm. But you could eat the... Well, that's a problem because you can't get it. It'd be so can't frustrating. Get it. <laughs> and it would just... It would just be awful and awkward because yeah. you know, especially if you're in London, some people bumping into your marshmallow would be bumped into all the time. And I'd rather yeah. take that foot. I'll be very honest with you, Richard. Yeah. Um, my wife plucks my toe hair anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, because I have very, very long toe hair. I don't have a problem with it. 
Um, if, you, if you wear sandals in the summer, it's lovely to feel the wind blowing through your toe here. It's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, I've stopped now because I just don't care any longer. Because, you know, in the beginning of a relationship, you bother, and then after a while, you think, well, you, you won't find anyone anyway now. And, you know, no one would take her on. So I just leave it. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm in the bath, it's like seaweed. <laughs> That's very nice. I'll give you one more, right, and then we're gonna, we're gonna, we've got to go. We've got to go. We can't just take up all of these people's <laughs> time. This nonsense. Got to pull something back. Um, would you rather be lactose intolerant or the Prime Minister of the Central African Republic? <laughs> it's difficult because I like milk tarts. Yeah. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> As all my fans do. <laughs> You should start selling milk tarts that you're getting. That might be the way for you to. <laughs> I think get, I'd get rather support. be president of the really? Central African Republic. Yeah. It's a tough job. Yeah, but I like I I can't drink coffee without milk. Can it's I? a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. To, it's a long commute from Glasgow every day. Yeah. It's you're not you know you're not you, you've got to realise like so Donald Trump. So can have a custard cream, you see. No, that's true. Because that's got dairy in it. I mean, it'd be awful not to be able to drink milk, but you know also. It's like Donald Trump. You can't just go in Monday to Friday. You have to do the No, I'd, commit. I'd go there. Okay. My career's doing fuck all now anywhere here, so I may as well go and become a, like a demagogue somewhere okay. over in Africa. Do you, know, do you know who the current Prime Minister of the Central African Republic is? Nope. Simplicy Saranji. Oh. So uh, you, learn something, you learn something on this podcast. Do you remember him? Do you remember him? <laughs> do, you remember him? <laughs> do you remember him? I'm going to ask you next time you're on whether you remember who the, he is. So Say try it and again remember for me. It. No, you've had your chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll ask you one more because I've never asked anyone this question and I'm going to be fascinated to hear what you are and I'm sure it'll be a good answer. Would you prefer to have lungs that turned oxygen into jam that would come out of the pores of your skin and could be scraped into bottles and sold <laughs> as long as you didn't tell your customers where it was coming from? <laughs> Or an anus that weep manuka honey, honey, an anus that weep manuka honey, which is can also be sold. Though imagine the anger if people found that way. You'd be getting that, that sweet, sweet honey. And you can make manuka honey is very expensive. I should uh, add if you don't know. Do you think? Are you suggesting I wouldn't know that? No, I'm just letting you know. I'm, I think because the audience, I'm from I'm Scotland, I don't know what, what no, expensive think things the, are. I think my audience. That? I think my, I think your audience, who've only got well, a no, spare 125 audience, pounds a week, would not Your know. audience are apparently, the, uh, like, I know what Manuka honey okay. is. <laughs> <laughs> Jam, for the simple reason yeah. that if my anus was weeping, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any substance, it would cause chafing, and if you've ever had anal chafing, you know it is quite painful. But would honey cause chafing? I mean, wouldn't yeah, it be any a sort of bar, a soothing balm? Any form balm? of moisture in the anal region will cause chafing. It's a nice and, and if you imagine, <laughs> if it's the stickiness, yeah. it's essentially like waxing your anus every day. Yeah. That if if you've ever caught a pubic hair, a back pubic hair on something yeah that's really sore okay and if you imagine trying to function as <laughs> when as did you catch one of your back pubic hairs on something and what was it was it Miriam margot's sister <laughs> <laughs> what a shame to do a call back to the thing that has to be cut out anyway. i know <laughs> it's a it's a uh, it's happened more than once but one time i will tell you about it. um when you buy a swimming costume as a lady they often have a protective thing on the gusset area yeah. so that if you try it on in shops you, you don't uh, weep vaginally onto it <laughs> and it, and if you put it on and, and it's the adhesive is in some way you can catch an anal hair on it okay, all right. and I have I have caught an anal hair <laughs> I'm glad to, I'm glad we got there in the end that's all I've been trying to get out of you for the whole podcast I don't think there's anything. I don't think there's anywhere we can go after that. After discovering, well, we we're going to talk about my nipples, but we don't have time. We don't have time to talk about your nipples, but ne maybe you'll come back. I mean, assume the lipstick was on your nipples when you said that you put lipstick on for me anyway. But uh, it's. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the film Under Milkwood? So anyway, <laughs> that would have to go, wouldn't it, if you're lactose intolerant? So uh, it's. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much.
much this is going to go out. But I said that in the last one and it all went out. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a massive round of applause to Susan Kalman. <laughs> How do you like them Sky Potatoes? <laughs>